Almost didn't make it this week, kids. Had some issues, almost didn't make it, but I got pulled through by a very, very special guest. And I'll tell you all about it on the other side. You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Ladies and gentlemen, we have in the studio today, for the first time in a long time, a very special guest. Now, I used to have guests in on every episode, kids. Those were the early days of the podcast. Those were the early days of the evolution. And today, I'm delighted to announce that with me, by my side, actually behind me, is none other than Dr. Ho himself. And I would insert the applause sound effect, but I don't feel like doing that right now. Yes, I have Dr. Ho here, not in the flesh, but on my flesh, okay? I've got the Dr. Ho pain therapy electronic diode pad things, all right? Now, this is must-own equipment for those of us who have, in particular, lower back injuries that occasionally cause us lower back pain. And that's me, kids. That's your humble host. Owing to a back injury suffered in the gym nigh on 20 years ago, went into the gym one day as a younger man, and... I had been doing some work the day before, lower back was pretty tired, man, and so I gets under the squat rack. Wasn't even using a lot of weight, kids, but I got to the bottom of a rep, and didn't my back just give out, and that's a scary feeling, man, that's a scary moment when you find yourself calling for help involuntarily. You know, a part of you just kicks in, man, you have within you this mechanism for survival, this mechanism for self-preservation, and you will just find yourself doing things to survive in moments that you are not doing consciously. So I'm at the bottom of a rep calling out, help, 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 and a dude comes running and picks me up, and I falls on the floor. And... You know, a few minutes later, after laying there on the floor, with my back having given out, I did maybe the bravest thing I've ever done, which is somehow pull myself to my feet, which in subsequent episodes like this I've not been able to do, but in that moment, embarrassed and humiliated and freaking terrified because your back goes out for the first time and you don't know what that is... I somehow managed to pull myself to my feet with my back in full spasm. Without me knowing that's what was going on, I thought I've broken my back. I've slipped the disc. I've done something that's going to require a surgery. My life is over. You know, those things begin to crowd into your mind, but you're on autopilot, man. You're in shock, right? And so I staggered my way out of the gym, somehow managed to crouch and get into the car... And then drove home with my heart banging in my ears and you begin to regain consciousness. And you're like, that's when the thoughts come in. What have I done? What have I done to my back? What have I done to my life? And so I got home and I got out of the car and then I was on my hands and knees in the parking lot at home. And my wife comes down like, what's going on? I'm like, I need help here, man. I can't get up again. That was I couldn't get up. And it was several days before I managed to get up again. And fortunately, not a slipped disc, and fortunately, not a horrendously traumatic back injury. But there was a sacroiliac problem and a huge back spasm. And my back has never been the same, kids. 20 years on, it's never been the same. And I do things now, like I have a yoga routine to try and keep it limber, you know, try and strengthen those muscles, but it's over, man. 
And I've had a couple of incidences since in the past 20 years where I've found myself on the floor again for a few days, usually as a result of doing stupid and stupid things. And the older you get, you think, you know, your wisdom kicks in and you're beyond that stuff, but you're not. And so I've had warning shots in the past couple of weeks, right? Down in my little basement gym, doing stuff that just puts pressure on the back. Now, I'm careful about it. And I don't have enough weight to be stupid anymore, really. And, you know, it, it's important to do things that exercise it, right? Like, you need to do things that force it to stabilize. Because if you don't, if you protect it too much, then you get muscle atrophy, and then you, you wind up with chronic problems, all right? So it's a fine line between strengthening those muscles so that they're functional and overdoing it and putting it in risky situations where your sacroiliac joint twists again and then you're in back spasms and then you're on the floor. And it's one of my great fears, as I've said in the past, to have a full-on back spasm when I'm on the road. That terrifies me, man. Don't even like to talk about it now because of law of attraction, man. Don't want to manifest that. But I had a couple warning shots in the past two weeks or so doing stuff in my little basement gym that I should have been smarter about, you know, but it's like, okay, I feel a little bit, but it's okay. Like you get very super duper sensitive to how things are feeling and you know, if you're in the red zone or not, you know, but then today I'm just reaching down to pick up the cat bowl and it just goes, <coughs> that electric feeling goes through you. And that's a terrifying feeling, man. When you just feel it happen, and you're like, oh no. Oh no, after all of the work, after all of the progress, are we on the floor again? We're not on the floor again, all right? All of the training, all of the kind of working on that mobility has made it so the last couple of times I've felt the big tweak, it's just been the big tweak. Things haven't gone into full-on spasm, and that's the reward of all the work. So I feel it, and I'm like, okay, uh, I'm red zoning here. Like, one false move, not even one false move, it's not even that close. It's like maybe a, a 7.5 out of 10 danger zone, right? Whereby 9 is one false move and I'm on the floor, and 10 is I'm on the floor. So I'm at a seven and a half, okay? It's a big warning shot. Like, dude, stop being stupid. Be careful, man. And it's not insignificant and probably not a coincidence that it happens on this week, okay? Because I've had a wobbly week again, all right? I've been down the rabbit hole of thinking negative, you know, and feeling a little bit hopeless and feeling a little bit sorry for myself, you know? and worrying, and having kind of anxiety, and I've had kind of the dark thoughts begin to come in again, man. They're always poking at the door, you know? They're always on the perimeter, the dark thoughts, man. And it just takes one little lapse for them to slip in, man. Arsenal is the object lesson, you know? They can play a great game and have everything under control, and then one lapse of concentration and the ball is in their net. This happens all the time, man. And it's alarming how many of the times they do it themselves, like they put the dang ball in their own net or something like that. And so that's the sports analogy for what was going on in my back and what's going on with my thoughts. You know, I had a conversation with a friend about kind of drumming and some of the stuff that I'm weak on and that I've kind of... Not exactly justified, but I've found excuses for, you know, that's not okay. And then it sends me very quickly down a rabbit hole about my own playing and my own lack of ability and therefore my own lack of potential for opportunity, you know. This stuff weighs on me all the time and we know I got the issues about the self-doubt, right? And I was thinking about the podcast and what's not happening with the podcast and I was mostly over that kind of stuff, the vanity metrics kind of stuff. But, you know, when there's a breach, when there's a breach in your thinking, it all comes in, man. It is all circling around you. If you can imagine like a fortress, right? Like one of those castles in Germany that is built up 
on a high hill for safety, man, because it's much, much tougher to assault from below than it is from above. You always build your castle on the high ground, man. World War I, the Germans always occupied the high ground, man, on the Messine Ridge and on the Vimy Ridge, you know? You always want to occupy the high ground because everybody's circling below you. See, if you can imagine, you know, you're thinking, or, or a, a castle within you, or a safe space within you that is protected, that has walls, that is defended, and you got to be vigilant about that space, man, because it is all circling around you and i've been an open door <laughs> at times in my life i've been a freaking open door man for all of the marauders all of those vikings all of those barbarians out there that want to break in steal your castle man want to ravage that space i've been pretty vigilant but you know i let it slip one little crack in the wall one little bit of self-doubt, one little bit of anxiety, one little bit of, you know, a sort of wobbly faith, and it all comes in, you know? And I'm lucky that they only kind of breached the perimeter, you know? I got a few layers of defenses, man. That's also a First World War thing. It wasn't, it wasn't just a line of trenches. It was a line of trenches behind trenches behind trenches, man. Layers of defense. And I've built up some layers of defense. And so the first layer got breached this week by the kind of negativity. And that's a human thing, man. We are none of us robots, all right? We have emotions, we have feelings, we have experiences. And these are crazy freaking time, man. So your outer perimeter is going to be breached from time to time. But it's no surprise to me that it showed up in the physical, okay? Because I spent this whole week at war with myself about what I'm doing, about where I'm going, about what's possible, about what I have in me. And, you know, if you don't push that out, it will show up in the physical. It'll show up as a gallbladder attack. It'll show up as a head cold. You know, your immune system will be compromised. And it'll show up in a back injury, man. The physical thing happens and it did to me and it did this morning and so here's dr ho with his electronic diodes which are a lot of fun man you know those those patches you put on your back there's four of them and the the dr ho thing has got like uh, a knob where you can set the power zero to like five and it's got different settings for how it massages you and you can feel the currents going through you man and it feels kind of cool so I don't mind having Dr. Ho with me, but I could do without the back problems. And it also means I don't know how much I got here, okay? Like, I debated seriously not doing an episode at all, but I'm sitting on my stool, and I'm trying to do it, all right? You know, guard your thoughts, kids. Be a little bit protective about your thoughts. And it's really hard right now. This is the anniversary, man. It was a year ago-ish, almost exactly, within a couple of days that I released the Viral Times episode. And that followed having returned from Mexico and things shutting down and me going to the Walmart for the first time and seeing all the toilet paper gone. That was a year ago that the madness began, man. And I don't know if we thought that it would be a year later and here we would be. Still kind of in and out of lockdowns, music not happening. You know, my friend of mine had a, a year ago today, a post on Facebook, which was kind of a lament for all the side players. <laughs> and he tagged me and a bunch of other locals who are normally side players, who at that time, you know, things were beginning to shut down, and it looked like it would be a little while before we could play again, and it was a sort of shout out to all of us folks for not being able to work with our artists anymore. And did we think that a year later we'd still be sitting here? not working with our artists and, you know, kind of seeing that life just fading a little bit away, man. I don't know what we thought a year ago. It was weird and strange and like a movie, as I said in that episode. But it's a year later and here we are, man, and the stress remains. You know, I went to the dentist this week. I'm normally a, a every four months guy at the dentist, all right? My teeth are vulnerable. My wife has like ironclad teeth. I don't know if she's ever had a cavity. Maybe one. I think she had one, 
and it devastated her. <laughs> She's got perfect teeth, man. They are strong, indestructible. My teeth are somewhat softer, okay? And I didn't go to the dentist for a long time, like eight years or something like that. And then when I got there, there was work to do, man. That was like 15 years ago. We got me in shape, and it's been good ever since. But I haven't gone for a year because of the COVID. And so that's uh, dicey. I was beginning to worry, and then I was feeling a bit of pain, a bit of an ache, a bit of an issue with a tooth, man. And there's a filling in that tooth, and I thought, well, maybe something's up with the filling. Maybe there's another little cavity because I haven't gone in a year, and I'm vulnerable. And I ignored it, and I ignored it, and I pushed it off, and then for a couple of days I wouldn't feel it. It was like, okay, it was a weird nerve thing, and it's over. But it came back, and so it's like, all right, I better go to the dentist and find out what's going on, man. Because I couldn't pinpoint it. It was just a, like an ache, like something up. And I have weird psychosomatic stuff too, all right? It's a jungle in here, okay? <laughs> you know, I set up the perimeters, but inside there's some chaos. You know, there's some weird people running the show in here, all right? Psychosomatic stuff. So I go to the dentist and she has a look and she's like, well, I can't see anything wrong. Did the x-rays, which I do not enjoy. And can't see anything on the x-ray. She says, I think you've been grinding your teeth, man. What? think you've been grinding your teeth. And so we did like the bite test stuff with that little strip of paper. And she gets out the drill and she's like, Zzz! she's like, you know, sawing off part of a tooth, you know, leveling things out a bit. I'm like, what? I've been grinding my teeth. I've never known myself to be a grinder, man. And she's like, yeah, I think that's what's going on. I think you are grinding your teeth. You're clenching your teeth. And, it, you know, it's such, your jaw is such that it's that tooth is getting affected by it. Or one beside it, we're not sure. And that was an eye opener, man. That was an eye tooth opener. Grinding my teeth is the stress, is the anxiety such that it's, you know, it's, it's not even conscious now. Like, have we just adapted to this level of stress and that's normal life now? And she said to me something that blew me away, man. She says, oh, yeah, I've had way, way more incidences of that happening. I've seen that coming in in the past year. She said, I've had people come in who have broken their teeth off, man. People have broken their teeth off grinding them because of stress and anxiety in the past year related to the COVID. Now, how much of an eye opener is that? You know, is that what's going on? Is the stress like microwaves? Is the stress like, you know, the 5G signals going through the air? We can't even see it. It's just life now. Are we that stressed out? Have you noticed this? I hadn't been paying that much attention. I mean, I had a huge anxiety breakdown and I've not fully recovered from that and may not ever. You know, I felt that. But is there just so much pervasive stress level now? that we've absorbed that and what's it doing to us, man? You know, I get into the dark mode and my back goes out and I think that's related. Now it looks like I'm grinding my teeth and I gotta get a bite guard. It's like, I can't even control that. How do you fight an enemy you can't see, man? That's so pervasive and it's everywhere and it's just getting into you. So even if you don't have the COVID virus, you might have the COVID stress. And that shows up in physical ways, man. And I don't have an answer to that. I'm just acknowledging that maybe that exists. People are breaking off their teeth, man. And so I'm doing an episode now because maybe you need it. Maybe I need it. Maybe I need a release in some way. Or maybe you just need an hour of kind of getting away from it all and hearing another voice. You know, I've had people write to me and say that they like that this show is uplifting. And I appreciate that, man, because I'm trying to make it that. And I'm trying to not make this an ego trip. I'm trying to offer some value, right? And I've had other people write in and say that they checked out some of the music. So people have listened to Dirty Looks, and people have listened to The War on Drugs. And people have listened to Black Swan, and people have listened to The Dead Daisies, and people have listened to Crownlands, and that's great! That people are encountering new music through this podcast you know that's kind of the point too for me and for you and music is medicine man music is therapy 
you put on a piece of music and it and it inspires a release in you of some emotion. And evidently, because we're all busting our teeth off, we kind of need that release, man. So I'm glad the show is doing that for you, and I felt an obligation to do another episode today with Dr. Ho, just in case you need that, and just in case I need it, all right? Now, can you stand another synchronicity story? I forgot about this one. I was talking with my buddy, Elena's dad, about the synchronicity part of the last episode, which I still think is really cool. And I was reminded of the Greg Bissonette story. Do you know Greg Bissonette? You do. If you're around in the 80s and you're a rock and roller, you know Greg Bissonette. Greg Bissonette was the drummer in the peak David Lee Roth era, okay? So there was like a band that was maybe the greatest collection of individual talent ever assembled in rock and roll. It was David Lee Roth, Steve Vai on guitar, Billy Sheehan on bass, and the drummer in that arrangement was Greg Bissonette, all right? If you go back to like the Eat em and Smile days, I think, you know, that was the band. Wow. What a band, man. Greg Bissonette was that guy. But he's also a drumming legend, you know, that that kind of sparked the legend. But he has remained such, and he's the drummer in Ringo's all-star band now. And he plays, like, big band stuff, and he plays rock and roll, and he's just one of those super-duper, top-of-the-ladder pro drummers. That's Greg Bissonette, all right? Now, here's the fun synchronicity. Because Greg Bissonette is also a voice of Winnie the Pooh. (laughs) <laughs> Didn't see that coming, did ya? All those years ago with Steve Vai with the big heart guitar with like the three necks on it. Greg Bissonette playing the drums. You didn't see Winnie the Pooh, did ya? How did Greg Bissonette get to be a voice of Winnie the Pooh? Well, that's the fun synchronicity story, man. So one day, Bissonette's on a session, right? He records a lot of film soundtracks. And I believe they were doing the soundtrack for Finding Nemo, okay? And there was a problem with Bissonette's chart. So he's reading the music off a chart as they're recording it. And his chart, there's like a repeat section or a coda that seems to be on everybody else's chart, but isn't on his. And so at a certain point, he leans over to the bass player, who is his brother, Matt. And he's like, dude, what's going on with this chart? My chart's different. Do you have this on your chart? Is that on his chart? What's going on with this chart, man? And as he's talking, there's people in the control room of this session, and they're listening, right? So Bissonette's out on the floor, and he's arguing back and forth with his brother. And then somebody presses the button, and a voice comes through from the control room that says, Hey, Greg, drummer, uh, come in here, please. We want to talk to you. And Greg grabs his chart, and he gets up, and he's going into the control room, going to argue about this chart thing, because that's what he thinks it's about, because they've been listening to him argue, right? And so he gets into the control room, and standing in there is a super-duper high-end executive VP Disney guy. And Disney guy is in charge of voices for Disney, all right? There's a lot of voices happening, and I hope he hears this story and gives me a call. And so the guy doesn't want to talk about the chart at all. He doesn't give a crap about the chart. He's like, say that again. Business like, what? Say what again? Say what you just said to your brother out on the floor. So Bissonette repeats it, and the dude says, you've got the voice. You've got that raspy kind of high voice we're looking for. He's like, what are you talking about, man? He's like, we need a backup Winnie the Pooh. We got a guy who is the voice of Winnie the Pooh, but he can't do all the sessions. So we need a backup guy. And you got the voice. Greg Bissonette's like, what? Long story short, Greg Bissonette, opportunity knocks, kids. Bissonette says yes to whatever it is they're proposing. And all of a sudden, he's doing like Winnie the Pooh dolls and Winnie the Pooh like video game stuff. And he's the backup voice of Winnie the Pooh. When the guy can't show up to do the Winnie stuff, 
Bissonette learned how to do the voice, how to do the cadence, how to do the little sort of verbal nuances that is Winnie. And he can affect his voice. And he now does the Winnie the Pooh voice, man. And he's done other voice work. He's opened up this whole sideline as a voice actor guy. All he was doing was arguing with his brother about a chart in a studio, recording some music for Finding Nemo. The right person happens to be in the control room, twigs to his voice, calls him in, and all of a sudden, Greg Bissonette has this whole other line of work. But he had to say yes, kids. He had to step up. He had to learn. He had to learn how to do voice. He had to learn how to do that voice. Had to develop his ability. But he did it, man. And isn't that just another great synchronicity? It's freaking cool, man. And I like it, all right? So be inspired. A year after COVID changed everything for everyone. Opportunity still knocks, man. Synchronicities still happen. You know? Sometimes they're going to breach your outer perimeter, but you build up your defenses and you push them back out again. And maybe as a consequence, your back goes. You got to do a little bit of repair <laughs> around your perimeter, but it's possible to do, man. And go listen to some Winnie the Pooh and think of Greg Bissonette and then think of David Lee Roth. Weren't expecting that the next time you hear Winnie the Pooh, were ya? All right, we're doing okay. We're chugging along. Back's feeling all right. Dr. Ho's working away down there. Feels good. Feels cool. We haven't done a game in a few weeks. And if you were listening to the end of the last episode, to that Easter egg after the closing credits, you know, I floated the idea of playing the Rush game. So why not play the Rush game today, kids? What's your humble host's favorite Rush song? Fortunately, there's only like a thousand albums to choose from, but most of those albums, the songs are so freaking long, there's only one or two anyways. <laughs> Gonna give you a list of Rush tunes. You can write in and tell me which one you think is your humble host's favorite Rush song. Here we go. Fly By Night, Tom Sawyer, Subdivisions, Limelight, Time Stand Still, or From Snakes and Arrows. Working them angels. Let me give them to you again. Rush songs, Fly By Night, Tom Sawyer, Subdivisions, Limelight, Time Stand Still, or Working Them Angels. What is your humble host's favorite Rush song? Write in and you could be a big, big winner, man. Maybe get your name mentioned on the podcast. Now we're going to spin a record, kinda. And that's about all I can say. I say spinning a record kinda because I haven't had a whole lot of time to invest into this week's album. And so I feel as though it would be a disservice to call it a full spinning. I've been through it a couple of times, but I haven't really focused in and locked on. But what we're going to talk about today is the new album, When You See Yourself by Kings of Leon, all right? Do you know the Kings of Leon, kids? I have a history, a weird history with this band, okay? And it goes back a long way. And it goes back into an initial annoyance, all right? Because Kings of Leon, of course, have a very similar name to King's X, right? Now, we all know about me and King's X. So back in the day, back in the very fading embers, the frayed edges of the CD era... Back in the, I guess, early 2000s, I'd go into the record store and I'd go to see, I'd always, if I went into a record place, a CD shop, I would always go to the King's X section, A, to make sure they had one, and B, to see what's in it, all right? I always want to know that King's X is still in some way present in these places, right? Now, I'd always go to the King's X section, depending on how the store was laid out, if they had just like general rock section. The King's X section and the Kings of Leon section would be together. 
back to back, man. And I would always go looking for, or you know, it would happen sometimes that I'd go looking for the King's X section and there wouldn't be one, but there'd be a Kings of Leon. And I'd be like, who is Kings of Leon? What, what is a King of Leon? What is this? And for a long time, that was just me and Kings of Leon, the band that was either in the way of or in replacement of King's X in the CD store. Which fast forward a few years, and I get to know my pal Stace, Stace, who was my connection to the Queens of the Stone Age show a few episodes back. And she is the biggest Kings of Leon fan I know. And so I got to know the band a little bit through that, and Stace gave me some CDs to listen to and stuff, and that's cool. And then we went to see Kings of Leon at what used to be the Molson Amphitheater in Toronto, which I think is now the Budweiser stage. And this was peak Kings of Leon, all right? So Sex on Fire was out, the song, you know, and Use Somebody, and everything off of that particular record. It was when Kings of Leon had really blown up, man. And so we went to the amphitheater, and they were headlining, and they sold the place out. And it was really interesting, and you'll see why in a minute. But, you know, people didn't really, didn't seem to know a lot of the music. And then they played Sex on Fire, and the place just lit up, man. Like everybody singing at the top of their lungs. Everybody was there for Sex on Fire. And that's why you want your band to at least have one giant hit, man. <laughs> That's what happened to King's X. They didn't have one giant hit that everybody from miles around would come to hear, you know? A couple of minor hits, not a fill the amphitheater, sex on fire hit. And you'll see in a minute why that matters. And they were really good live, okay? Now, I, I've had one primary issue with Kings of Leon. And it is probably exclusively my issue, okay? Now, the singer... Caleb Followill, they're all related. Couple brothers, cousins, the Followill boys, right? Caleb Followill has a really great voice. It's a unique voice. It is a voice you recognize, and it's really cool. But it's always bothered me on the recordings, okay? There's just something about the frequency of the way they produce his voice that would just kind of grate on me. It was a little bit harsh on my ears for some reason. And I think that's probably just me, man. That's just frequencies colliding in my head. You know what goes on in my head, man. Things bounce around in there. So I, I never really enjoyed listening to the records because of the production on his voice. It would just grate on me somehow. But then when we saw them live, it wasn't like that. You know, his voice sat in the mix differently. It was a bit softer, you know, and it's great. He has a great voice. I never didn't like the voice. I just didn't like the production. So the first thing I noticed on this new Kings of Leon record, When You See Yourself, is that his voice doesn't seem to be produced that way. Now, there's, there's one of two explanations I can give here. One is they've changed the way that they record his voice. Maybe three explanations. They've changed the way they record his voice, or his voice has changed, which, you know, it's been 20 years or whatever. Or I've just lost just enough high-end hearing now <laughs> that I can't pick out whatever it was that was harshing me before, okay? And I'm losing my high-end hearing, kids, all right? Despite trying to protect my ears when I play and stuff, yeah, it's, it's beginning to go, so I have to be a little bit careful. So maybe it's just, you know, taking the edge off of Caleb Followell's voice for me. I don't know. But it doesn't sound the same to me on this record, and that's cool. Now, this whole record sounds different. I have not followed, all right? They've released stuff since Sex on Fire, and they remain an enormously popular band, etc. But this record, you know, I sat down to listen to it, and it feels like a real evolution to me. I don't hear a giant radio hit in the vein of Sex on Fire on here. I hear... What's beginning to sound like an alt-rock band, man, and you know I am into that. There is, you know, some different kind of depth on these tunes. And it's got a really dark kind of vibe to it. It's a little bit chill. Caleb Follow will, you know, he pulls back. That probably helps, too. He pulls back on some of the vocals a bit. It's a bit more restrained, you know. But I haven't listened to it enough to give it, you know, an honest spinning. <laughs> We're going to call this spinning, but, you know, it's, it's not maybe a full spin. 
but I do like the record, okay? And I like that it's understated, and I like that it's got an alt-rock vibe. It reminded me at times of kind of Coldplay in the early days. If you go back to Parachutes and you go back to A Rush of Blood to the Head, it felt like that a little bit to me, but it also felt a little bit Radiohead. It felt a little bit Britpop. These guys are true blue, you know, Southern American boys playing Southern American rock, you know, kind of roots kind of stuff, rock and roll. It sounds like a bit of a Britpop thing to me, and I think that's cool. That's an evolution, man. And I wasn't expecting that. I read a review of the record that called it Moody, and I think Moody is just about the perfect way to describe it, because it is that. There is a darkness about this record. I don't know how much of it was written during the pandemic, but maybe that affected it, man. But there's also different sounds happening here. There is some complexity in some of the arrangements. There is an ambition in this record that I really like. I feel like they were going for something. Now, again, I haven't listened to anything since the big radio hits, really, man. So I don't know if this is the way it's been ever since. And they've always had a little bit of that. Like, it's been in the earlier records, too. Probably my favorite, or one of them, Kings of Leon tune, is Knocked Up. Go listen to Knocked Up by Kings of Leon. That's an old song. But they've always had just a hint of this darkness. Just a hint of this complexity and depth. You know, if you only know them, like the crowd at that show I went to, from Sex on Fire, there's a lot more to this band than that giant radio hit, okay? And it comes through on this album, and that's why I mention everybody singing that song at this show, because it's like, I don't know if those folks are going to dig this album. I don't know if any of them have ever listened to anything except that tune on the radio, you know? But if they plug in and check this out, there isn't a Sex on Fire on this album. There's some really cool songs, there's a really chill vibe, there's a dark vibe, there's ambition here, but I don't hear a big commercial radio hit doesn't mean there won't be one, but there isn't really an obvious one to me, and I like that, all right? From somebody who's into the war on drugs and who appreciates the national and these bands that have built huge followings without big commercial radio success, right? I appreciate this about this record. I can't say a whole lot about it. I'm going to highlight a few songs if you want to go check it out for yourself. Make up your own opinion on Kings of Leon. If all you know is Sex on Fire and you think, okay, it's another rock band, whatever. There's more to it than that. And if you want to check out this record as an example, I'm going to suggest you check out the tune 100,000 People. 100,000 People is just another vibe song, man. It's got this trance-like quality to it. This, I think, has been released as a single, but it ain't a sex on fire, man. It demands a little bit more of you. And again, it's got this trance thing going and this chorus that's kind of like this repeating kind of thing. You do, you do, you do. You have to hear it. I'm not going to give you the vibe speaking about it. you got to go and listen to it, all right? But go listen to 100,000 people. It's got this keyboard thing happening. It's got this mood to it. It's a cool song, man. You might dig it. My favorite song on the album so far is called Golden Restless Age. All right. Now, it's more of a mid-tempo thing. I think it's got great single potential among these tracks. And it's another one of these tunes that's got kind of a cool call and answer thing happening in the verse. I've talked about this on some of the harder rock albums that do that so well. Bluesy kind of tunes do that so well. You know, a line of lyrics and then a guitar answers with a lick or a riff, you know. This has that, and I really like that. I really like the flow of this tune. I really like the tempo of this tune, Golden Restless Age. And it comes in with some horns. Just subtle horns. It's not like a big, like, it's not like a New Orleans Dixieland kind of horn section comes in. <laughs> It's not Motown, just horns, just sort of background, kind of presenting, again, vibe, man. Again, darkness, moodiness, you know, it's in this tune. And then there's a, a little guitar solo part. Those of you who have become fans of the War on Drugs, and in particular fans of the way lead guitars sound on War on Drugs songs, which always have this kind of effects on them, you know, this sort of echo or reverb, and then just weird sounds I can't describe because I ain't no guitar player. You know, that comes in on this tune. It's an 
alt-rock kind of sound, man. This sort of distorted, weird, cool-sounding lead guitar part comes in on that tune, which I dig, and then I just like the verses, man. I like the verses. I like the way they flow. I like the groove on this tune. It's a good one. Golden Restless Age, all right? There are other tunes that I like. Time in Disguise is great. But I'm just going to draw you to the last tune, which is called Fairy Tale, okay? And it's, you know, got this, again, this vibe, this darkness, man. It's got these ethereal kind of sounds running through it. Kind of whispery, you know? Some strings come in. It's moody, spacey, ethereal. Just another one of these cool, vibey songs, man. And it gives you a different flavor on this band than what you might know from the radio hits, okay? It's like they're reaching for something here. And I applaud the reaching, man. You know, they maybe get tired of playing some of those radio hits. Mm, Maybe they don't. I don't think I would. You know, I've heard like Lars Ulrich complain about playing that song again for the eight millionth time. I'm like, dude, that song bought you a house. So maybe they don't get sick of playing Sex on Fire. I wouldn't. But you know, there's more depth. As I've said, I'm repeating myself now. There's more depth to this. And the tune, Fairy Tale, is a cool, alt-rock, kind of spacey, vibe, chill-out song. I was thinking about listening application for this album, and I think the listening application again is driving. Which is a drag, because we can't really drive anywhere right now. You know? If you find yourself in the back of a tour van, this is a good one to put on your headphones, okay? This is a sit-back-and-listen-to-it record. It's another sit-back-and-listen-to-it record. And that is kind of a staple of alt-rock stuff, I think. Like, you need to focus on it. There is not an immediate... Not so much an immediate kind of presence to these tunes. Like, you notice them, but it takes a few listens to catch the wave, you know? Like, Sex on Fire, you grab right away. That's what makes it a big radio hit. Super catchy, makes musical sense right off the bat. You know, in that chorus you can sing along with at the top of your lungs. And they did! Oh, they did. So, you know, some of these records, it's not exactly a genius record in the Paul McCartney vibe where you got to listen to it 10 times and go, oh, oh, there's the thing, <laughs> you know? It's just weird. This is not a weird album. It's an alt kind of album. Not immediate. doesn't jump into your ear holes right off the bat. But it's cool, man, and I like this record, and I'm going to listen to it a little bit more. But you can go and listen to it too, man. Because music is medicine, kids. And we all need it because we're breaking our teeth off at night. And, you know, despite Dr. Ho's help, I'm starting to feel the back a little bit here. And I don't have a lot else to say, and I don't want to waste your time just talking for the sake of talking, man. But I do appreciate the folks who have written to say, hey, we're enjoying what you're doing. And I checked out this record and I dig it, or I checked out this record and I didn't dig it. That's perfectly okay, too, man. I'm not advocating for anybody, all right? I'm not a pitchman for anything. I'm just presenting music to you that you might not have heard before, and you might dig it and you might not. I don't even love all of it, but, you know, it's what's in my ear holes. So I'm presenting it. So go check out the Kings of Leon record, you know? Let me know what you think. And drop me a line if you're enjoying the show, man. It can be difficult to work in the vacuum. You know, and if if you listen to other podcasts, you know, if you consume anybody's art, I'm not calling this art, but if you consume anything that people put into the world, take a second and tell them that you do that, okay? And tell them that you like it. And tell them what you like about it. Because it's tough, man, especially here in Covidia, where you don't really have interactions with people so much anymore. It's just nice to hear somebody's out there listening and appreciating. Or somebody's consuming the music that you make and appreciating. Somebody likes your podcast. Somebody likes your art. If you're listening to other people, drop them a line and say so. Drop them a dang sentence. You know, I got a comment a couple weeks ago about an article that I posted on my website like two years ago. Nobody ever comments on what I've posted, right, on on the blog, and I haven't updated that in a long time, but 
I got just a little message from a guy. It was like, I agree with what you're saying, man. You know, whatever. Somebody read it. Wow. Somebody I didn't know, who is not my Facebook friend, found that story and read it and left me a little comment. And that warms the cockles, man. So make a point this week, even if it's not me, just to write to somebody whose stuff you consume and say, hey, I'm a follower. I like it. Keep going. You have no idea what a difference just that tiny little encouragement can make, man. Because the people who are out there right now making podcasts, all 1.7 million of us, 98% of those people are hanging on by a thread, man. You know, this was the conversation I had with my friend earlier this week that helped start my little spiral. 98% of those people are hanging on by a thread. They are looking for reasons to keep going, man. And they're not trying to get rich. They're not even trying to make money off of this thing. They just want to know somebody cares. They just want to know somebody's listening, man. And it's the same with the people who are putting out music or producing art or poetry or writing. You have no idea what a shot in the arm it is for one freaking person to just write in and say, hey, man, I notice you're doing good. Keep going. That might get you another month of podcasts from somebody because I promise you a high percentage of them are hanging on by a thread with all the work that goes into it for so little response. I promise you one sentence can change a person's freaking life. One note of encouragement, even to somebody who's not producing art, <laughs> who's not producing anything, you know, just checking in with someone with one dang sentence to say, hello, I know you exist. Hope you're doing okay. So make a point this week, man, of reaching out to one person, whether it's art you consume or not, and just saying, you're doing good. Keep going. All right. That's one little step we can all take to maybe protect everybody's teeth. <laughs> All right, we nearly did an hour. Dr. Ho, uh, you know, I dedicate this episode to Dr. Ho. If you've got back problems or muscle injuries or whatever, these little electronic Dewey Daddies can uh, really help, man. So check out Dr. Ho. Hope you're doing okay. Hope your teeth are all right. And do drop me a line. You know, the ratings on your favorite podcast platform. I could use that, man. It definitely helps me, warms my cockles. Just a little rating and review on your Apple, on your wherever, you know. Helps just a little bit. I'm not trying to twist your arm, man, but if your arm gets twisted, Dr. Ho's electronic diodes. All right, I'm heading out, kids. Hope you're doing okay. Have yourselves a fine week. Listen to some good music and tell me about it. And let me know what you think my favorite Rush song is. And I'll check you later. Thank you once again, gentle listener, for taking in today's show. If you want to know more about the program, go to www.john-huff.com. That's J-O-H-N-H-U-F-F.com and click on podcast. You can also find the show on Facebook at The John Huff Podcast. If you're an Instagram person, you can find me at JW underscore Huff. If you're a Twitter person, you can find me at at J.W.S. Huff. No matter where you listen to the show, please do me a big, big favor and leave a rating and review. Preferably a positive one. That's all the time we have for today, but I'll be back very soon. Until then, keep your wits about you and remember... Good things happen when you put yourself out there. Bye for now. I was going to sign off with the brush your teeth song, but I can't remember how it goes. But still, you should brush your teeth, okay? It's important. You know, weekly if you can.